Personally, I'm not much into motors or even mechanical movement. However, there is one motor which does interest me very much indeed, and that is a small DC motor which has be been rewound as a result that when it is connected across an old discharged lead acid battery in very poor condition, it not only runs powered by the battery, which is supposedly impossible, but it actually recharges the battery at the same time. Now that motor does definitely interest me, as it is acting as a battery cell charger, which is very difficult to achieve with electronic circuitry. Commercially available DC motors are deliberately designed and manufactured to have extremely poor performance. In my opinion, the reason for this is that a properly designed electric motor would easily do away with the need for using internal combustion engines in vehicles and that would not suit the oil companies or their owners, the New World Order cartels. Worse still, electric motors with a coefficient of performance greater than one open the way to self-powered free energy systems and that would never do. Dr. Peter Lindemann's video uh, available on YouTube with the pointer here is available on the web and I strongly recommend that you watch all of it. It presents the basic facts very nicely. In brief outline Present day motors act both as a motor and a generator of electrical power, but they are deliberately wound so that the power generation is used to oppose the input power and so produce a completely crippled output. During World War II, a German engineer rewired a standard electric motor and made it self-powered. That is, it ran and produced mechanical output power without the need for any input power once it had been started. That shows the potential of a properly constructed electric motor with the same size and general structure of any commercial electric motor. Presumably he did that by adding extra brushes and using some of the windings in the generator mode with their output powering the drive windings which were arranged asymmetrically. There was also one other man who achieved self-powered rewiring of a motor but neither of those men made their information public knowledge. The con job which has been run on us for many decades now is to wind the motor in such a way that the magnetic fields inside the motor oppose each other. When a current is passed through a coil of wire it stores energy in that coil, and when the current flow is cut off, that energy needs to flow back out of the coil, and it will do so in the reverse direction. This is sometimes called back EMF, that's back electromotive force, although many people are not happy with that description. However, no matter what you call it, there is energy stored in the coil, and that energy can be used to do useful work. But the motor manufacturers choose to wind the motor so that instead of extracting that useful power, they use it to oppose a major part of the input power, creating a weak motor which heats up due to the wasted energy. Contributor UFO Politics points out that a deliberate misdesign of electric motors has for the last 130 years been presented to us as the only way to make and operate such motors. He states that because the windings are arranged in a symmetrical way, that a braking effect is produced which reduces the output power of the motor by anything from 50% to 90%. That is, a properly wound motor would have anything from twice to ten times the output power for the same input power. This misdesign guarantees that present day motors are always less than 100% efficient and always heat up when run. This misdesign is caused by using 
symmetrical windings inside the motor. Standard motor wiring is quite different and the killer effect is caused by having two windings which face each other, powered simultaneously with currents flowing in opposite directions. This causes a complete conflict between the magnetic fields and that destroys the efficiency of the motor. A very experienced experimenter has started a form a forum thread on the energetic forum, both to explain this and to show new and more advanced construction methods, and to answer questions and encourage and encourage replications and further developments. The forum is at energeticforum.com through that link shown there and it is definitely worth visiting especially if you are good with mechanical devices. The experimenter uses the, the forum ID of UFO politics and he has produ produced an animated video in an attempt to explain the basic problems with today's DC electric motors. There's a link there to his particular video. He points out that a problem winding in the standard DC motor looks like this diagram here. You have a energy input and an energy output which is mechanical power and he says that the way that the thing operates with the magnets inside causes an effect what is effectively a battery which is opposing the operation of the motor itself. He says the input current for any winding is fed in through a single pair of brush contacts. The generated electrical power EC is not extracted and forced to oppose the input energy EA leaving only a fraction of the input power to actually run the motor. It is likely that a motor of this type will only operate at 25% of its potential efficiency. UFO Politics has produced and demonstrated a simple way of overcoming this problem while using the existing motor housing, magnets and brush contacts. He does this by extracting the generated electrical power as a useful output and so preventing that useful power being used against the motor's operation. To implement this he adds one additional pair of brushes and re rewinds the motor coils like this. And this diagram here shows what he's talking about. One pair of brushes at the top and one pair of brushes at the bottom of the armature which is the bit that is inside the motor housing and provides a mechanical power output, the coils are rewound to form a series of separate vertical coils connecting to one brush terminal at the top and one brush terminal at the bottom, as shown in this diagram. The input power is between the terminals on the left and flows through the coil shown in brown. The current flow generates a magnetic field causing rotation because of the permanent magnets marked N for a magnet which has its north pole facing the coils and S for a magnet which has its south pole facing the coils. The black zigzag lines represent the resistance to current flow of the wire and the brush contacts. The coil shown in green on the right represents the same coil at a later moment when it has been disconnected from the power supply and rotated until it, reach, it reaches that position, at which point the energy stored in it is taken off as a useful output via the right hand pair of brushes. However, this is just an explanatory diagram and it does not show the very important fact that the discharging coil must not directly face a driving coil because if it does, then the energy discharge would create a magnetic field which it would interfere with the magnetic field of the driving coil and create a major problem. Right, to say that again, any one coil is powered on the left hand side to drive the armature around and provide the output shaft with its turning power or torque. Then 
That rotation disconnects that coil from the input power, leaving the coil charged with energy, which has nowhere to go. That charged coil continues round until it hits the second set of brushes, which allow it to discharge through a load and do useful work. The really clever part of the adaption of the motor is best seen from above the vertical rotor. It is, for example, if you were to take a five-pole DC motor apart and remove the windings, the shaft and armature body might look like this. When making an asymmetrical motor, um, the windings are rewound in this style here. The start of the wire is secured at the top and then fed downwards through the opening A and back up through the opening B. For the small radio shack motor the windings would be 25 turns of American wire gauge number 30 wire described as radio shack red wire with a copper wire diameter of 0.255 millimeters. If you are rewinding a motor armature please understand that each wire turn needs to be pulled tight in order to make a tight solid and robust coil which will not vibrate unduly when the armature is spinning. The end of the wire marked finish is not cut but is taken down through op opening A and this time taken up um, through opening C and the opening C is shown in this diagram here. So having done the dark red winding tightly you take the end of the wire down through A and back up through C and that is the way that the second part of the winding is constructed. The end of the wire again is not cut uh, when you finish doing the winding through A and C. The final wire turn goes down through opening A and finishes at the other end of the body of the armature. In these views the wire runs down into the paper each turn forming a cylinder. This view may give you a better visual pictures of what the coils are wound on. This is the armature here and these are the bearings at each end of the motor and these are the magnets that are internal to the motor itself. The next step in rewinding is to connect the start and finish wires of this V-shaped double coil to the commutator slip rings to allow the current to be passed through the coil at just the right moment. Seen again from one end of the armature the connections are like this. The start and finish wires uh, connect to the uh, armature brush connectors. The commutator slip rings are connected further up the drive shaft and the start of the winding wire, shown previously in dark green, is connected to the top commutator section in the position shown here. That's where the start wire is connected. The finish finishing end of the wire is connecting to the corresponding sector at the far end of the shaft, that is the sector directly in line with the upper sector just connected to the start of the wire. This completes the first of five identical V-shaped coils. The next coil is wound in the same way. The armature is rotated one sector counterclockwise so that sector D replaces A at the top and the next coil is wound with the wire starting at the top and going down through opening D and up through opening E, repeating the same number of turns and then without cutting the wire the next set of wires are wound going down through opening D and back, back up through opening F. The start of the wire is then connected to the commutator sector 
which spans between openings A and E, and the end connected to the corresponding commutator sector at the other end of the shaft. For each of the remaining three windings, the shaft is rotated one position counterclockwise and the same winding and connection procedure carried out. When completed, no matter which opening is placed at the top of the view along the shaft, the windings and commutator sector for the wire connections will be identical. Then there are three pole motors. Winding arrangement is slightly different for motors which have three poles, or multiples of three poles such as six, nine or twelve poles. For the very simple three pole motors, the armature looks like this. Very simple, straightforward. And with this style of armature, the winds are around the three arms as shown here. The start begins at the centre and it goes over the top, around, uh, under the bottom and up again and over the top for each of the three windings. And that's the way that the windings are done with many turns, obviously. As before, the commutator sectors at the top are duplicated at the bottom, allowing separate input and output circuits for each of the three coils. The windings have many turns filling the available space and each winding is connected to the slip ring sector directly opposite like this. So the green shown wiring there is connected to this particular point. The blue wiring comes out and is connected to the, pole, the uh, commutator sector opposite it. The red wiring comes out and is connected to the commutator section opposite the red winding. Uh, easier to see in the colours when you're winding it, remember all the wires are the same colour. The start of each winding is connected to the commutator slip ring at the sector at the top of the armature and the finish is connected to the slip ring sector directly below it, that is the sector which is at the same angle as the top one where the start of the wire is connected. This allows the brushes which press against the slip ring sectors to connect to both ends of each coil in turn as the armature rotates. Three pole motors are particularly powerful and motors with six poles can be rewound with pairs of adjacent sectors amalgamated to give three larger sectors. Nine pole motors can have three adjacent sectors wound as a single coil to provide the same effect as a three pole motor and twelve pole motors can have four adjacent sectors wound as a single coil. The positioning of the brushes is important. With the three pole and five pole arrangements the brushes are aligned with the gaps between the magnets which surround the armature. However, the rewound motor can be tuned for improved torque and reduced drive current by adapting the motor housing to allow some adjustment of the position of the brush and commutator slip rings relative to the coils. This adjustment need only be slight as the angular movement of the brushes will be small. It is of course essential that the upper and lower adjusted positions move by exactly the same angular amount so that every upper commutator slip ring remains exactly above its corresponding lower slip ring sector. In other words, the commutator slip rings at the top and bottom of each coil must be exactly aligned vertically so that the electrical connections are made and broken at exactly the same instant. The commutator and brush arrangements are shown here in UFO politics diagram and that shows the way that he has everything connected. It's a good diagram and uh, he's good at presenting the information. The commutator brush mark G for generator takes away the energy stored in each coil and passes it to an electrical load. Commutator brush marked M for motor feeds energy into the coil from the battery which is driving the motor. 
The red and blue stripes surrounding the armature are two permanent magnets. The magnet shown in red has its south pole facing the armature and the magnet shown in blue has its north pole facing the armature. This creates a magnetic field flowing horizontally across the armature. The five pole arrangement is like this and as you can see it looks a lot more complicated. It isn't really but it looks it. Here the designation RS stands for Radio Shack which is a chain of stores in America. In the forearm it is sometimes changed to RS and should not be confused with the large electronics outlet Radio Spares whose trademark is RS. UFO Politics has suggested that the cheap 5-fold DC motor available from Radio Shack should be used by experimenters to become familiar with rewinding DC motor coils. Being a cheap product, those motors do not have a particularly high build quality, but they are suitable motors for experimenters. Forum members share the details of how they dealt with adapting these and other motors. I have to admit that motor windings and operation tend to confuse me, and I sometimes find it difficult to understand what UFO politics means when he talks about different winding strategies. However, it seems, re seems reasonably clear at this early stage of forum development that his objective is to produce two things. One, a very powerful electric motor which can be used in serious forms of road transport as well as for other practical applications and two a powerful motor generator combination which can produce useful generated electrical power. While UFO politics is very yeah, very patiently going through many of the possible variations on how a DC motor can be wound and connected and showing various forum members where they have failed to get some of their windings positioned correctly he has also shown some of the best ways of connecting a rewound motor used as a driver or prime mover as some people like to call it and a rewound motor which is to be used as an electrical generator. He shows two important ways for making a very effective motor generator combination as shown here. You have a face to face connection mode with a motor and a generator and you take the output which uh, has charge capacitors across it to smooth out the operation and it gives an effective electrical output. It, seem, it needs to be realized that these arrangements are not conventional arrangements and that the rewound motors operate in a different way to motors bought off the shelf. For this reason it is necessary to isolate the electrical output to prevent current flowing through the load from affecting the operation of the motor generator combination. This can be done by placing a diode in each of the output lines and charging a capacitor bank which is then used to feed whatever load is to be powered. If my understanding is correct then feeding any cold electricity produced into a capacitor causes the current to become conventional hot electricity. It is not clear if that action is part of this arrangement though the circuit circuitry shown should be used. This is the second version. This is face to face connection mode 2. The arrangement is very similar except for the way that the power is adapted and taken out of the system. UFO Politics comments on these arrangements as follows. He says, as we excite the input of the motor, the generator will start producing energy. And that additional energy will flow through the motor output side because they are connected in series here. Two rectifiers must be connected at both output terminals, positive and negative, to avoid backflow from closing the circuit through the load. As the motor accelerates, the generator boosts the energy flow 
which then runs through the motor augmenting the output fields and when the output is loaded then an engagement of both machines occurs as they start to compensate each other through their output flows. It should be understood that the output should be capacitor banked I as a dedicated reservoir. When designating a generator for a specific existing asymmetric motor machine, it must be understood that generator inter interactions should be considered to run as counter rotation to the motor machine's originally conceived rotation, which is easily done by just moving brush lines, passing stator uh, by sector angles to the opposite of those needed for a motor, or alternatively setting the timing backwards. This will definitely enhance the assisted rotation of both machines when connected together in this face-to-face -face mode. As I personally don't find the forum comments easy to understand, I recommend that you visit the forum and read the posts as you may well understand the con conversations easier to follow than I do. On the forum, Sanskara316 states, I have rewound a small 3 volt 3 pole motor. I used an almost dead 6 volt sealed lead acid battery to power the motor. This battery just sits at around 4 volts and if given a load, even a small light emitting diode, its voltage drops to 1 volt. The rewound motor started very slowly, barely spinning. Then after a minute or two it started to spin faster and I noticed that the voltage on the battery was slowly climbing. I connected a small LED flashlight to the generating side and it lit up. Now the battery voltage is under, under load is around 2 volts or maybe more than 2 volts. It's been running for an hour now and the machine squeals a lot. It is conditioning the battery and the meter cannot be showing what's really happening. The motor draws 300 milliamps. That's not possible as the battery just doesn't have that power. To which UFO politics remarks, well I'm glad you have witnessed some of the effects. These rewound motors do recondition batteries. Remember, radiant energy is taking over the machine. So radiant energy comes out through the input also which is the reason why we get high volts to amps reading on a meter. These motors use very small amounts of current and volts. Inside the motor every coil is being self electromagnetic electromagnetically pulsed because they auto disconnect from the power source. Then the next coil in the sequence is assisted by the first coil when it is rotated to its next position and so on. The commutator switching has become a self oscillator for every independently energized coil. Another forum member says I have also replicated the battery charging events that Sanskara 316 indicated. I started with a 12 volt 4 amp hour battery which I had been using with another circuit two weeks ago and had not recharged it after using it for hours. It was sitting at 12.4 volts. I took my best running rewound motor, plugged it in direct and ran it. The battery voltage dropped to 12.24 volts and stayed at that level for 30 seconds. The battery voltage then started to rise. It rose at a hundredth of a volt per minute. When it was at 12.27 volts, I disconnected the motor. The total run time was less than 5 minutes. I then let it rest for 5 minutes. At the end of the 5 minutes, the battery voltage had risen to 12.43 volts and is still at that voltage now. Just think what a larger motor would do on a big back battery bank. Everybody needs to document this test as it proves what UFO politics said. New DC motors, and particularly cheap motors, will have brushes 
which do not mate cleanly with the commutator slip ring sectors and so when the modification has been made running the motor for some time allows the brushes to wear in and that raises the efficiency of the electrical connections which in turn improves the performance of the motor. If you wish to build and test one of these motors then you can find help and support in the forum with your questions answered and numerous videos and photographs from different experimenters to help you.